uh, went and I, was the surprise successful? Was, okay, they were, they were going to surprise Donna's parents, which is always a fun thing. So uh, they were over there and enjoying time with that, and so uh, obviously we, we miss Pastor, but it's kind of an interesting aspect. We are going to cover verses 24 through 31 of John 20, um, but Pastor Glenn was going to cover last week, but things got shuffled around verses 19 through 23 of chapter 20. Uh, so he's actually going to pick up that portion next week. So we're going to look at this passage out of order. Okay? Uh, we're going to reference some of the things in 19 through 23 just so that it gives us a, a little bit of a complete picture. Um, but uh, that, that's where we're going to be at. And the funny thing is we're leaving all the hard stuff in that first part for pastor to cover next week. There's some, uh, some interesting things as we read I'll point out, but uh, enough to where uh, it wouldn't I couldn't do it good service if I just tried to brush over that. So pastor's going to pick up on all that for next week. Uh, like I said, we're in John 20, and uh, starting in verse 19, I would just like to pray for us one more time, ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, guide us to what is true, and uh, that we would hear from God this morning. Uh, God, thank you that we have your word. Thank you that we have just your testimony of who you are God, your testimony of the fact that you sent Jesus to this earth to die for our sin and to rise from the dead so that we could put our faith and our belief in that fact. And uh, God, we just thank you that you loved us enough. You saw where we were at and you extended mercy. And uh, God, we thank you that you give us the strength that we need. You guide us to what is true. And so we would come to you, God, empty-handed. We would come to you in need and we want to hear from you, and so we pray you'd speak to us today. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said in verse 19 of John 20, it says, On the evening of that day, let me stop right there. That day is talking about the day of Jesus' resurrection. Okay, if you look at the beginning part of John 20, uh, this is, again, when Jesus has risen from the dead. This is when Mary first goes to the tomb. Uh, and so Jesus has already appeared to Mary. This is when John and Peter rush to the tomb and they saw evidence of Jesus' resurrection, but they haven't necessarily seen Jesus himself. Um, and so this same day on that evening is what we come to when we come to verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. We're going to stop there. We'll read the rest of the passage in just a little bit. But I want to just uh, discuss this for a second. In that evening, when the, right after Jesus has risen from the dead, the disciples are together. And they are gathered, and we don't know where they're at, most likely still in Jerusalem or in that area, but they're gathered together, and it says the doors are locked, and they're huddled, and they're fearful. And most likely they're fearful of the religious leaders, and there could still be this, this fervor in Jerusalem, this uh, again, animosity towards people who are followers of Christ. And so they are scared. They're scared of what could happen. Maybe they would get arrested. Maybe they would get taken to trial. Maybe they would be, uh, again, put on the stand for following Jesus. Uh, maybe they just are still shooken up about the fact that the man that they had followed for three and a half years is gone. And they're probably confused in the midst of this. They've heard the testimony of Mary, who Jesus came to, and she uh, could attest that he had risen. They've heard the testimony of Peter and John who saw some evidence of his resurrection, but there's still confusion. There still isn't this 100% affirmation that Jesus really is risen from the dead. So there's fear, there's concern, there's, uh, again, just 
this, this unease that is present. And it says the doors are locked, they're huddled up, and we, we just have this scene that is present. And then Jesus comes. And it is impressive to see that locked doors do not stop Jesus. Jesus is not blocked out from where he wants to go. And so he enters into their room. He enters in and he sees them. And they see Jesus face to face. And I love the very first thing that Jesus says to them is peace be with you. Peace be with you. Again, this was a fairly common greeting within Hebrew culture, the idea of shalom, uh, but the truth that Jesus, his first thing, what he wants to affirm to them, what he wants them to take away is peace be with you. And you think about how that would have soothed really their souls. All the tension, all of the, the fear, all of the anxiety that they had been facing from his crucifixion up until these last few days, again, peace be with you. And as they're gathered together, as they receive that, as they're in the presence of Jesus, their response to that, to his peace, is it says, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And I I don't necessarily like, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, maybe you're reading from NIV or King James or from NASB. Uh, I know NIV uses the word overjoyed. And I'm pretty sure NASB says that the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And really the, the word for glad, it's this idea of abundance of joy, this excitement. There's a, a, an increasing in joy that they are so thrilled that they are seeing the Lord. And so Jesus extends this peace and there's this joy that comes from that. And this peace that's present and this uncontrollable, this, this joy that is there. And Again, that's such a true thing for us. When Jesus comes in, when Jesus is present, when he extends peace to us, there's joy. There's excitement. There's, again, this thing that satisfies our heart and our soul, and the disciples experienced it right then and there. Again, going on, uh, Jesus then says, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you would withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. That's the portion we're not going to cover, and Pastor Glenn's going to cover that next week because there's some pretty interesting doctrinal and theological aspects there. Uh, talking about Jesus breathing on the Holy Spirit onto them, uh, especially I was talking with Michael Ginsburg actually about this before the service, but this is before Pentecost. This is before the Holy Spirit was sent to the church and so how how do you wrestle with this that jesus breathes the holy spirit pastor glenn's going to address that next week and uh again just this question of if they if they forgive someone god will forgive someone if they withhold forgiveness from someone god will withhold forgiveness from them How, how do you wrestle with that how do you wrestle with that and so again pastor glenn will cover that but i wanted to paint the picture for us in this that the night of Jesus' resurrection, there's this fear, there's this huddling together, and yet Jesus enters in. And there's peace and there's joy that is brought to those groups of guys, those groups of believers who are gathered together. But then if you look at verse 24, right after that it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. It's just an interesting aspect of this that the 12, actually there's probably only 10 and then any other people that aren't mentioned because Judas is out of the picture by this point. So there's the 10 disciples minus, or in addition with Thomas who's not present. But they're gathered together, they experience that, but Thomas isn't there. There's a lot of questions we could ask and just as I was studying this, you know, no one knows exactly where's Thomas at. What is Thomas doing that he is not present with the disciples? You know, did he have a prior <laughs> obligation? Probably not. Uh, was, he, uh, uh, was he fearful and just thought maybe if I'm a part of a group of people, we'll be more likely to be found? Uh, that could be a possibility. Um, you know, was he just so discouraged? Did he not believe Jesus rose from the dead at all and just thought, man, I've wasted three and a half years of my life. The man I followed has been crucified and he's done and he's just depressed. 
the raw emotion of that. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why he wanted to isolate himself at that point. There's a lot of reasons. Okay? If we look back, back though, at Thomas and when Scripture had mentioned him before, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like fear or discouragement would have been a big reason for that. Because we look at John 11, 6, this is when Jesus is actually going back to heal or to raise from the dead Lazarus. Okay? And Jesus, prior to that point, uh, had been in Jerusalem, and people were trying to kill him at that point, but he escaped. And so he wanted to go back to where Jerusalem's at to go raise Lazarus from the dead. And his disciples are saying, no, that's not good timing. We can't go back. People will try to kill us. But it's Thomas who says, we should go. We will join you. Even if we die, we will follow you. And so Thomas wasn't necessarily scared of, again, dying for a cause. Following Jesus wasn't necessarily something, if it cost him his life, he was concerned with. So why he wasn't present, I don't know if fear was necessarily a reason. If you look at John 14, 5, again, that's right, uh, the verse following that is when Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But prior to that is when he's telling his disciples, he's going to be going away. He's going to his father's mansion to prepare a place for us. And Thomas asked the question, where are you going? We need to know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. And so we see there's this inquisitive spirit about Thomas that he wanted to know where Jesus was going to go. He wanted to make sure that he could follow after him. He could find, again, where he was going to be at. So those are some of the passages, some of the glimpses we get into Thomas's character, but we don't know. We don't know where he's at. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know what kept him away from those disciples that night. One of the truths, and I want to just spend time focusing on this, and I have this written uh, in your notes, is that whenever we isolate ourselves from gathering together with other believers, whatever the reason is, and there's some legitimate reasons, we miss out on God's blessing. You think about if Thomas would have been there that night. If Thomas would have been there and he would have seen Jesus, he would have seen that the one he had followed for three and a half years truly was risen from the dead. He would have experienced that peace that Jesus spoke to them. And he would have experienced that same gladness and joy. But he wasn't there. He wasn't present. And in some respects, he missed out on that blessing that was available, that would have been present had he been there. And I think that's a similar truth. And again, we don't want to stretch God's word too much in our application here, but I think it's a truth that when we are not present, when we isolate ourselves from being with other believers, from being gathered together, there's a blessing that comes from that. There's a blessing that comes from meeting together and focusing on Jesus and expecting him to show up. And when we are gathered together and that's our common focus and we, uh, again, are able to just be together in agreement with that, there is blessing. And you know, There's a lot of reasons why people would isolate themselves. And we can speculate about that. There's, you know, personality conflicts. You know, maybe even Thomas, who knows, did he get along well with all the other disciples? Did Peter rub him the wrong way? Uh, was he concerned about that? We don't know. There's a lot of reasons, but even in our church, in our context, in our modern society, there's a lot of things that would keep us from wanting to gather together. There's a lot of things that would appeal to us to want us to isolate, to not be a part of the body, to not focus on being together. I remember uh, for me and my family, um, when we were, grew up in Tacoma area, went to a church up there, and uh, after my sister went to college down in uh, Salem at Corbin, where I went to college at, um, we, uh, our stuff in our church just was not going well. And our, our lead pastor had retired, and there's just a lot of internal disunity. And it was a very hard thing. And my dad had served uh, as a deacon for several years, and my family was very involved in just serving in the church. And yet more and more, there was just a lack of peace in my parents' heart about being involved there. And this was over several years, and it was absolutely not a rash choice this was probably a five-year time period of just, just this, this disunity that was going on. And uh, my parents prayfully considered that, and my dad also went through some, some job-type issues and uh, transitioning out of his job he'd had for a long time and finding more temporary work. And uh, 
eventually my parents moved down to Oregon. And that whole time, we were still attending church, but until we settled, until my parents really settled on a home church that they could get plugged into, even though they weren't necessarily sinning and not being a part of a body, they recognized, and we recognized, they missed out on blessing. They missed out on just the blessing that comes when we gather together and purposely wait for Jesus to show up. And I think if you're not a part of a church family and if you choose to kind of isolate yourself, uh, that, that you miss out on that. And that's a hard thing, and that's something that there's legitimate reasons for sometimes, but there's a lot of times where we make excuses for that. You know, and this isn't the, the sermon where I'm pleading with you, you need to make sure your church attendance is spot on, but just the truth of the fact, when we gather together, when we're here and we're looking to Jesus to show up, there is blessing that cannot be denied from that. And Thomas missed out on that. Thomas missed out on that. Uh, looking at verse 25, uh, let me read this. It says, So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Even in titling this sermon, I don't know if anyone caught how we titled this, but we phrased this unbelieving Thomas rather than typically we refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas. And we think about this idea of doubting and just contrasting with the idea of unbelief. I would phrase it in this way, and hopefully by the time we're done with this, it'll make a little bit more sense, but doubt really communicates, I cannot believe this. I cannot put my trust in this because there's something about it that just seems off to me. The evidence doesn't necessarily add up. There's some inconsistencies. I have a hard time with fully trusting that. I, I cannot trust that. Whereas unbelief speaks more to, I will not trust that. I will not put my belief in that. I will not, um, again, accept that. And there's an idea where one is more excusable, so to speak. There's some legitimate things that maybe need to be addressed to address the doubt, whereas unbelief really is more a matter of the heart. And in Thomas's situation, and as we see this, Jesus, I think, reveals that his really was a matter of unbelief. It wasn't just doubt it was a choice that Thomas made to not believe that Jesus rose. And hopefully we'll see then, and hopefully we'll get to why I think that's significant. And if you look at verse 25, it says, uh, I'll start in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. The word for, uh, again, said or told, whatever that might be in your translation, but the idea when the disciples who were present that night, who saw Jesus come back to life, when they tried to communicate that to Thomas, the idea was that this was an ongoing aspect. When they said to him, when they told him, Jesus did come back. He was right here. We saw him face to face. We were with him. Again, it's almost this idea that they were pleading with him. It wasn't just a one-time occurrence. It wasn't just, yeah, hey, Jesus came back to life. It was pretty cool. They, there was a, there's an ongoing communication that was taking place. And you think about it, too. These were guys who knew Thomas well. They had been traveling together for years at this point. And even if there's personality conflicts, even if there's not necessarily this completely harmonious group, there's still intimacy, there's still closeness just from being around people for that amount of time. And there's probably trust that was established between Thomas and the other disciples. And so for Thomas, he has this evidence that's presented to him. He has this statement, he has this, uh, again, truth that's presented that Jesus is risen, and he denies it. He doesn't want to accept it. He has reason to, and yet he chooses not to. Again, I really pick up on the very end of verse 25 when he says, unless these things happen, I will never believe. 
Again, that to me, and this kind of is our next point in here, speaks more to a, a willful choice rather than struggling with some doubts. Okay, and this is where I think sometimes as Christians we can fit into either of these categories, that sometimes we have legitimate doubts. There's things that I doubt about my Christian faith on a fairly regular basis. Okay? And when I say doubt, I'm not saying that, you know, I just will never accept this truth, but there's things I need to study more. I need to pray about this more. I need the Holy Spirit to guide me and really speak to my heart so that I have clarity on this. There's doubts that need to be addressed. Okay, but on the other side, if we say I will not accept it, that's a hard issue. There's something that needs to change in me to where I can take God at his word. I can truly say, God, I don't understand it. There's things that don't add up to me, but you're God, I'm not, and I'm going to trust you. And for a lot of people, there's a heart issue that hinders that and gets in the way of that. And I think where Thomas was at, he says, I will never believe unless these things happen. And he puts God in a box and he limits him and he puts these stipulations on God before he's willing to, again, take Jesus at his, at his word, take the testimony of the disciples at their word. So when we think about that, again, this is another point where I'd say application for us. What do our actions reveal, again, about what we really believe, what we're willing to believe and take God at his word? And pastor says this often, and I think it's a very wise statement, that what we believe will result in action, and what our actions are will reveal what we truly believe. And I think in the same way, when we take God at his word, when we're willing to trust him, that reveals, again, that we believe certain things about him. But in our life, if we're unwilling to act in faith, if we're unwilling to pursue what God would want for us, I think that reveals we really don't trust him. We really don't uh, have that same type of belief that we should. You know, and so for us, you know, what is it that I have a hard time taking God at his word on? What is it that I have a really hard time believing that this is real, that this is true? Even if God has said it, have I accepted that? Do I really believe that? Obviously in Thomas's situation, and maybe you would disagree, but based off of when Jesus interacts with him, which we'll talk about in a sec, I think this really is his moment when Jesus comes to him when he is saved. Because after Jesus appears to him, after, John, after Thomas sees G, Jesus raised from the dead, his first statement is, my Lord and my God. I think when he sees him and he puts his trust at that point, I think that's when he's saved, but I think his unbelief has hindered him to that point. And so obviously the example here I think is more of a salvation example, but for us, what does our unbelief reveal about our relationship with God? What doubts do we have that are hindering us in that way? Thomas is at this place where he says, I will never believe, but God doesn't leave him there. And this is where I think it's amazing. Look at verse 26. It says, eight days later, his disciples talking about Jesus' disciples, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Again, however critical we are of Thomas in his disbelief, the truth is Jesus still steps in. Jesus enters the picture. Jesus comes in and he extends grace and he extends mercy to Thomas. I love that picture about Jesus that even though often we are, we're terrible people if we're completely honest. And we make choices we should never make. We walk inconsistently uh, both before we know Jesus and often even after we know Jesus. There's times where we doubt. There's times where we don't take God at his word and that's not revealed in our actions. And we struggle and we fail and yet Jesus still extends grace. 
And we're not saying that as an excuse to continue in that. We're not giving that as a license, but that is part of who Jesus Christ is. And that's an incredible truth that he still extends grace. And I love that Jesus comes to Thomas and he even caters to what Thomas said he wouldn't believe in Jesus for unless these things happen. He comes to Thomas and he allows him, put your fingers here, put your hand in my side. Whether Thomas actually did that or not, Jesus extended grace to the point where he was willing to allow that to happen. He was willing to cater to that. You think about just what Thomas is feeling. Even what Thomas is feeling, because this is eight days after that. What's going through his mind that whole week after he just said to the disciples, I will never believe these things. And then a week later, Jesus comes and his whole outlook is changed. If you put yourself in Thomas' shoes, what's going on in his head? And just the humility, I imagine, that he probably is experiencing at that moment. Just the humility, and not in a derogatory way, but just in a way that he just realizes, man, I can't believe that Jesus would come, first of all, that he's risen, but that he would actually allow me to do that. And just the how mighty God is and how small he probably felt. And yet, Jesus extended that grace. And we see this throughout Scripture. And uh, I was actually talking with Mr. Taro about this earlier today, too. He brought up the example. But we see in Scripture just the example of Moses. And again, in Moses, when he's getting called to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, and the number of excuses that he makes. You know, that I'm not able. You know, I, I... How are they going to know that I have the power of authority and God, uh, again, caters to that, so to speak? He gives them the staff. He gives them the signs that he can do uh, to legitimize his his authority. He also allows Aaron to be the one to speak for him because Moses feels like he's not capable. And just the fact that God, at his word, said, I'm calling you to do this. And yet Moses, often in disbelief, said, you know, I can't do these things. I can't, I can't, I can't. And yet God extended grace. He extended grace in allowing, again, just Moses to come along, to grow in that. And God still was loving towards him. Uh, The example of Gideon, too. And sometimes we view this maybe in different ways, that the example of putting the fleece out. You know, you could look at that maybe as an example of his faith in God. But you could also look at it as an example of really maybe not trusting God at his word initially and needing continued affirmation and really just maybe not believing as fully as he should have. But God has extended grace despite our disbelief, despite not taking him at his word. Um, And that's just an incredible thing. You know, and the the application of that is for people in our life, you know, especially in a salvation sense, who we desire to see come to know Christ. And maybe if you just close your eyes and you think in your head, who is it that you know who needs Jesus? Jesus did not give up on those who were hindered by disbelief. He extended grace. He continued to pursue and he desired that they would come to know him and he extended that in the same way. We need to continue to reach out. We need to continue to pray. We need to continue again to recognize, you know what? If God is willing to extend grace to me, I need to extend grace. I need to be an example of this. Those people that we've prayed about for years to recognize God is still capable to break down walls. God is still capable of reaching their heart. Lastly, and this is kind of the flip side of this, uh, beyond just doubting and unbelief, um, there's blessing that does come from belief. I'm going to look at uh, verse 29 and then uh, 30 and 31. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here's our verses. Hopefully these sound familiar to you. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is an interesting one. If we look at verse 29, when Jesus says, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
You know, some people might take that to say that there's a greater blessing or a greater reward for those who believe in Jesus even though they haven't physically seen him. And I don't know if I would, if I would say that's true, but a couple things that I think are true. Okay, when we believe in Jesus without seeing him, there's this sense of anticipation. There's this sense that even though I have not seen him, I'm putting my trust in him, but one day I will see him. One day I will see him face to face. One day I will be with him and be in his presence and I cannot wait for that day. That is a reward. That is a blessing that we have that to look forward to. Not as an escape from, uh, again, serving him in this world, but as a foundational hope that we can go back to, that we have that anticipation. Beyond that, though, there's also, uh, again, just I guess you could say trust that even though we haven't seen him, we still have to rely on him. We still have to put our trust and our dependence on him. And it's interesting because the disciples and those who are physically present with Jesus still had to trust him, still had to depend on him, but that looked different. Obviously, when Jesus was physically with them, the ability to take him at his word might be a little different than for us who Jesus isn't physically taking him at his word. It shouldn't be, but just in our human, how God is wired is I think sometimes that temptation is there. And so for us, just the, the blessing to believe without seeing, there's this trust that is built. And I think ultimately there's a greater sense of maturity and dependency that comes from that. If there's nothing to, you know, really not anchor that to, but if I really have to trust this because I can't see it, I can't, again, pinpoint any one thing to it, but I'm trusting it, I think there is blessing because, again, we're all in at that point. There's nothing that we can hold back because we really have to surrender it at that point. Uh, Lastly, I think there's a greater reward and blessing just because it's pleasing to God. I think just the fact that Jesus affirms this, that it is a great thing that those would believe without seeing. I think that is just a blessing. God is, again, pleased when we take him at his word. Uh, lastly, again, the whole point of this, and this again sums up the, the whole point of the book of John, but I think this section in particular, and I enjoyed, as we've mentioned, 30 and 31 before, the whole purpose of the gospel of John. After studying and preparing for this, I think this gave this section just a really uh, a greater sense of, of meaning. When Verse 30, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And the whole point, and I I really think this section is great, that we see this example of Thomas, someone who struggled to believe. I kind of frame that with the disciples who did believe. But then you look at our own life, those who are in that tension, do we believe or do we not believe? And Jesus says, these things are written so that you may believe and have life. And have life in Jesus' name. And so we see this example that even though we might struggle with this, when we do believe, there's incredible blessing that comes from that belief in taking God at his word. If I really do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I'm putting my trust. He is my Savior. He is my God. He is the one who I'm living my life for. It's Him and Him alone. Again, it says that there is life that comes from that. There's joy. And I think of John chapter 10 when uh, Jesus says that He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. When I think of this passage and think of just this idea of belief, Uh, One of the things, and I love this author, I don't know if you know who John Piper is, but he wrote a book that's called Desiring God. And in this book, he kind of frames the whole book with this thought of Christian hedonism. When you hear that word hedonism, that's the the pursuit of pleasure. So my whole life is going to be lived pursuing pleasure, whatever's going to make me the happiest. And so he wrote a book called Christian Hedonism. That's kind of the subtitle of it. And in his book, he unpacks this idea that if we really want to be, again, fulfilled, if we want to have true and abundant and joyful life, 
And that's perfectly acceptable to pursue our greatest joy and our greatest benefit, which might seem kind of selfish. The only way we can do that is through a relationship with Jesus and through truly believing in him and surrendering to him. So it's this idea, if I want to have the best life possible, not talking about materialism, not talking about, uh, again, temporary things, but the most joy-filled, the most peaceful, the most uh, hopeful life that only God can bring, I have to find that in Jesus. And it's okay for me to pursue what's going to make me the most thrilled in life because I'm pursuing that in Jesus. And that's the byproduct that comes from that. And I think what Jesus is saying, when we truly believe in Jesus and we devote our life and our focus and our attention to him, the byproduct of that is we have life. We experience life, eternal life, but I think an abundant life here and now. Thomas, he struggled with that. He's a great example to us in that way uh, that we need to guard against. But the fact is God was gracious and he's gracious to us. We need to come to that place where we take God at his word, we believe him, and we can experience the joy and the blessing that comes from that. I encourage you as we just close in prayer, is there any area of your life, maybe it's here where maybe you don't even know if you know Jesus as your Savior, you're wrestling with that. Is there any area of your life where there's, there's a hindrance, there's a block that you're really not taking God at his word? really encourage you to talk to God about that. Talk to someone else about that uh, because that's big. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. Thank you that we can come to you and that you speak to us. God, I know in my life, I want to experience joy. I want to experience abundance that you define. I want to experience, God, just a life that I wake up and I smile and I'm excited for the day. God, I recognize, Lord, there's so many areas that I try to pursue that are never going to get me there. And yet, God, we come to a passage like this and we realize that if we believe you and that belief, God, changes our life because we're following Jesus, God, we can experience that. God, you're the one who defines what that joyful life looks like, not us, and yet we desire that and we want that. God, help us to trust you. God, to not be concerned and not be hindered by those things that would speak against you, but Lord, to take you at your word, to walk by faith and to trust you. God, I pray for those, uh, God, who I know and I'm sure people in our church know who there's something that's hindering. There's something that they are choosing to not believe. Holy Spirit, would you break down those walls? Would you draw them to you? God, we thank you that we have a relationship with you. We love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.